Hi, I'm Rahul Berry and I translate from Spanish and Portuguese into English. In April 2024, Rio Grande do Sul, a state in southern Brazil, was hit by a wave of devastating floods, affecting an area as large as the United Kingdom. By mid-June, nearly 200 flood-related deaths were recorded and more than 420,000 people were still displaced. This special reading series seeks to highlight works by authors from the region and raise funds to help with relief efforts for this extreme climate event. Please consider donating to our GoFundMe campaign by clicking on the link below the video where you'll find details about our fundraiser. Today I'm going to read from a forthcoming novel um, which will be published by Pushkin Vertigo in August 2025 by the uh, Rio Grande do Sul writer Samir Machado de Machado who's from the city of Porto Alegre which was very badly hit in the floods. Um, the story isn't set in Rio Grande do Sul. It's um, set in 1933, um, just after the Nazis have taken power and mostly takes place on board a Zeppelin flight from Berlin to Rio via the northern Brazilian city of Recife. It emerged like a Valkyrie in the skies of Recife, advancing through the clouds with a serenity that concealed its rapid march. Viewed head-on, it was just a silver disc, a shimmering shield, However, as it progressed, it was moulded by the light which struck its every surface, its slender forms disguising the astonishing reality. At that very moment, 67 tons were floating elegantly over the state of Pernambuco. Three years earlier, its first passage through the city had been the occasion for a municipal holiday and had brought huge crowds onto the streets. But this was no longer the first, nor would it be the last of its many trips to Brazil, ten per year in total between the months of June and October, undertaken with German regularity and without any accidents ever occurring. <clears throat> Although there were no longer any holidays or crowds, still there remained the fascinated gazes of people staring from their windows, children on the street and anyone else whose routine was interrupted by the sight of that 230-metre colossus. It was four in the afternoon when the ropes were tied to the mooring mast and the LZ-127 Graf Zeppelin landed in Campo do Jiquia, Recife. The first aboard were the customs officers, the maritime police and the port health authorities to ensure everything was regulation compliant. Then the passengers disembarked. For some, it was their final destination. For others, taken by car to the Hotel Central, it was the last opportunity after the three-day Atlantic crossing to stretch their legs or smoke, which naturally was not permitted on board, before continuing on another day and a half's journey to Rio de Janeiro. Hotel Central was the tallest building in the city, a yellow tower built in the style that had only recently come to be called Art Deco. Its seventh floor restaurant provided a panoramic view over the city. <clears throat> a group of tables was reserved for the passengers of the Luftschiff Bau Zeppelin, both those in transit and those waiting to board. Among them, seated alone at a table, was Bruno Bruckner. A glance at the date of birth in his passport revealed his age, 32. Stature, medium. Face shape, oval. Eye colour, grey. Place of birth, Berlin. Occupation, criminal police, police detective. A recent scar on the right side of his face, running from the temple to the middle of his cheek, gave a certain air of danger to his figure, which otherwise gave off a neutral, distant look of indifference. The swastika pendant attached to his suit showed his affiliation to the party, which was gradually sleeping into the entrails of every aspect of German daily life. Bruno was drinking his whiskey and soda alone while reading a recent edition of Aurora Alima, German Dawn, the Nazi party's weekly magazine published by the embassy in Sao Paulo. The news, several months out of date, reported how after having gained a majority in Parliament and thus consecrating their leader as Chancellor, the Nazis were now passing the Enabling Act, which gave absolute power to the Fuhrer to create laws without being inconvenienced by the Parliament or the courts. Bruno put the newspaper to one side. He took a brown paper envelope from his waistcoat pocket and from inside it removed the card his nephew had given him at the train station in Berlin before departing for the LZ airfield in Friedrichshafen. In the child's drawing, the airship was smiling like a big flying whale. Little Joseph had drawn his uncle inside that whale, wearing a hat and with his hand raised in farewell, as if he were the proverbial biblical prophet. Bruno smiled put the card back into the envelope and returned it to his pocket, trying to turn his attention back to the newspaper. The news was always delivered in the same tedious and optimistic tone of the party propaganda that was now the voice of a government which sought to fuse the party into the national identity. Being German would necessarily come to mean being a Nazi. Faithful to its beliefs in German, ra German racial superiority, 
the newspaper adhered to its totalitarian motto, Germany overall, love it or leave it. Thanks for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this reading. If you can spare any money for flood relief, please follow the link to our GoFundMe page in the description below the video. Obrigado. Thank you.